Thank you, Nate. We are starting a new series this Sunday, today, and Jeff typically would be the one to start that, but he's on vacation, so it falls to me. I'm going to open us up, and it is a series we've been doing these the last uh, few months or few quarters where we take some time to study an aspect of the Trinitarian God that we worship. So we started the series back last summer with Yahweh, and we really spoke to God as a whole, to the Father. And then back around Christmas time, we did a series on the Son, on Jesus, and now we're moving into the Spirit and the ministries of the Spirit. And so this morning, I'm just going to open up that series and, and connect a little bit to what we've talked about in the past and, and how the Holy Spirit, whom is part of the triune Godhead, how we know Him, how we connect with Him, and, and what this all means for our faith. I don't know about you, but I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I grew up loving Star Wars. It was the thing that my mom and I connected on the most, and I would take lightsabers all around and whack trees and whack dogs and whack my siblings with them. Um, I, I was a huge Star Wars fan. And as I got older, I, it was one of the, the things that I would daydream about. And that sounds silly, and my wife is going to be embarrassed whenever she hears this in second service. But I would make stories in my head about Star Wars. And the way that I would justify it was that I am connecting the Force, which is this impersonal, God-like thing in Star Wars, to God. There's no connection whatsoever. In my mind, I was trying to justify that by saying, you know, the Force is like the Spirit. The Force is this, and it's not. And the more that I studied God's Word, and the more I grew in my understanding of theology, the more I realized we have this tendency to think of the Spirit in this impersonal, force-like way that you get from Star Wars. That he is this entity that is there, and he's kind of God, but he's also not personal like God. He's, he's something other than God, but he's still God. Sometimes we struggle to put into words who the Spirit is, what he does. But I can tell you, he's more than just the force in Star Wars. And so this morning, in order to study who the Spirit is, we're going to ask a couple questions. Who is the Spirit? How do we know Him? And what does He do? And, and in studying those three questions, we're going to start by studying the Trinity overall. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Trinity, but the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together as the single God that we worship. They are three in one. And that is a mathematical anomaly to say that something can be three and something can be one. That is who we worship as Christians. The best way that I can explain this is through a picture, through an image that I'll have to confess. I use chat GPT to generate this image. Um, but it's, it's something that I've had in my head for a while. And anytime you try to use an analogy, anytime you try to use an image to explain God, it always falls short. So don't take this to mean that this is the explanation for the Trinity, but it might be something to help you visualize. That the Trinity is like an ice cube that is, has water pouring forth from it and water vapor arising from it. Why is this like the Trinity? Well, because water is the same element whether it's a solid or a liquid or a gas. It's H2O. And whether that liquid is pouring out from the ice cube or rising in vapor from the ice cube or is the ice cube, it is still water. It is one element, but in three different manners. And so we can think of the Trinity in this way. It is one. He is God, but he is three. And it can be difficult to understand that, to comprehend this incomprehensible nature of God. But understanding God in this way is not only paramount for our faith as Christians, but it is also why our faith as Christians stands against other religions that are monotheistic, like Islam or Judaism. 
because there are aspects of our faith that make more logical, coherent sense than those faiths because of the Trinity. And so we're going to get into that a little bit before we explain who the Spirit is. We first have to explain who the Trinity is. And we start from the very onset of Scripture to know the Trinity. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if, if you're studying the creation story, this you can't think of this as the first thing that God does. You have to think of this as the heading of the creation story, that God creates all things. Uh, the early church theologians referred to this as creation ex nihilo. That's Latin for creation from nothing. That God made all things from not a thing. Nothing existed prior to God. In the beginning, God. There, was no, uh, there wasn't anything else. There was God, and he created all things. And then verses 2 through chapter uh, 2 explains God's ordering of all those creations, all, all the things in creation. But first and foremost, we see in Genesis, God exists. Nothing else does until he says that it does. That God is eternal. God is timeless. He stands beyond creation because he brings creation into existence. A way that you can think of that is is if you build a house, you don't, your reality doesn't exist inside that house. If I built myself a house, my reality goes beyond that house. I can go to work. I can go to the grocery store. I can go see a pirate's game. I'm not confined to that house. I built that house But that house isn't my reality. If we say that God is attached to the creation that we live in, we're confining him to to the house that he made. But if God is truly God, then he's not limited by the universe. He's outside of it. He's eternal. He's timeless. And it's important that we start there because that means that God is infinite. That, that God is everlasting. But that can be hard for us to comprehend because we're not. We have an expiration date. I hate to break it to you. We, we are going to die. God is everlasting. God is eternal. But at the same time, he's relational. And it's important that God's er- relational because if we say that God is love, at which the letters of John say, which the Islamic faith says, with which the uh, Jewish faith says that God is love, the question we ask those other faiths is, okay, then who did God love in eternity? If God is love, then who did God love before there was anything else? In the beginning, God. So before anything was created, who did God love if he is eternal? Well, God is relational. He is love. But because he is three in one, He is eternally relational. That he exists in this this community of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, not just in creation, but outside of time, outside of creation. He is eternally love, and he is eternally relational within the Godhead. And he brings that relationality into his creation. He brings that relationality into his creation. Look, as, as you continue in this this opening of the Genesis account, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, if you read it too quickly, you might miss it, but the triune God is obviously active in those first three verses of Genesis. And if you need some more confirmation of that, you just turn to the Gospel of John, who takes the Genesis account and applies it to Jesus. In the Gospel of John, John says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. So what John is doing here is he's attaching Jesus to Genesis 1, 1 through 3. And you see that God the Father is there designing and creating and and as the architect behind creation, 
The Spirit is hovering over the surface of the waters, and God speaks. The Word goes forth. All three of the relational, eternal, triune God are there at creation, speaking into creation the existence and relating to his creation on and on and on. The triune God is relational within his creation just as he is relational within himself. But, and this is where it gets hard, God is one. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, this is, is, it was the most important passage for Israel. It's called the Shema because the first word in Deuteronomy 6, 4 in Hebrew is Shema, which just means listen. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But we just say God is three. So how is he one? Well, that's the simplicity behind it all is God is one essence, but he is eternally three persons. And because he's eternally three persons, he can eternally be love and be relational within himself, be relational within the creation that he brings forth from nothing because he is eternal, he's relational, and he's one. Nothing stands against him. And and this was an important point to, to make in the time of the Old Testament, in the time of the New Testament even, because all the different pagan religions of that time, they had their own creation epics where there was typically a battle fought. So for example, the Babylonian uh, pantheon, their creation epic was that the god Marduk killed the god Tiamat in battle and then took Tiamat's corpse and created the earth. That's their idea of how creation was made, that there had to be other things active in order for creation to happen. But what we believe as Christians is that God is one, he is eternal, and he's relational. He doesn't need anything else to be there to create. He creates from nothing and is relational with his creation because he's relational with himself. But the question is, how do we know all of this? How can we, comp- this is so incomprehensible. How can we comprehend who God is, how he works, how we know him, all these different details that are going on? How are we able to know this? Well, John answers that as well in, in this first chapter in verse 18. He says, no one has ever seen God, the one and only son who is himself God and is at the father's side. He has revealed him. John uses the, the, the word, word, which is in Greek logos, to explain that this is the Son. The Word is the Son. He is eternal with God, but He makes God known to us. He is the agent of God in creation. And the Spirit, as we'll see, as we continue to see, the Spirit exists within the eternal reality within the triune community of God. That, that what we learn from these three pieces of information about the Trinity is that the Spirit exists in this eternal reality, and Jesus makes this known to us. As we'll continue on here in a second, we'll see that Jesus makes known to us the spiritual, he makes known to us the things of God. But if God, if the Spirit is a part of this triune nature of God, this eternal reality of God, it means three things. It means that the Spirit is God. It means that the Spirit is relational. And it means that the Spirit is eternal. The Spirit is God because the Spirit is three in one, and He is a part of this Godhead. The Spirit is relational because God is eternally love. And if the Spirit is a part of this triune community of God, then He is relational with us. He's not this impersonal force that we see in Star Wars, He's relational. He knows us. He's, he works within our hearts. He molds us. He shapes us through the Father's will. And the Spirit is eternal. He has always existed and always will exist. And His understanding of things is beyond our own comprehension. Now, moving from here, that kind of answers the question of, of who is the Spirit but we're still left to the question of how do we know him? How do we know the Spirit? And this is where it gets a little bit into the weeds of theology. And this is what I love to do. So I apologize ahead of time if I start using some jargon that 
I'll try to explain myself. <laughs> the Spirit of God and, and Jesus proceed from the Father. And here's where we get this reference. It's in, in John chapter 15, verses 26 through 27. When the counselor comes, that's referring to the Spirit, the one I will send you to, to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. The understanding that we have here, if we go back to that image of the ice cube and, and the water, is not simply that God is just this in this stasis of he's three in one and they just sit there. But it's this fact that the father, think of the father, he's this eternal ice cube. <laughs> and there's water and there's vapor always existing as part of God. It's always there. But the son proceeds from the ice cube. That doesn't mean that he's anything less than the father. It just means that he proceeds, he comes out that's what the Greek word means there, to depart out from the Father. That doesn't mean he is the Father. It just means that the Father wills him out from himself to do his will in the same way that the Spirit departs out of the Father. They are three separate entities. They are one essence, but three persons within themselves. <laughs> and it's so hard to understand this language theologians in, in history have identified it as filiation and spiration. And essentially what those words mean, they're Latin terms that mean sonship and breath. That the Son is eternally the Son of God. He is always existing as the Son of God. He is always God, but He's always existing as the Son of God. And the Spirit is God, and He is always existing as the breath of God. He is always coming from God as his breath. Three separate persons, one essence of God. Thomas Aquinas, one of my favorite theologians in church history, has a really powerful quote on this. He says, Procession is not to be understood from what it is in bodies, either according to local movement or by way of a cause proceeding forth as an exterior effect, as, for instance, the heat from the agent of the thing being made hot, rather to be understood by way of an intelligible emanation, for example, of the intelligible word which proceeds from the speaker yet remains in him. Now, you might have read that and thought, what in the world was that? That's why Aquinas is fun, because you can just read the same paragraph over and over for an hour and just chew on it for a long time. What he is essentially saying is the Son and the Spirit, they're not coming from a Father in the sense that the Father is, is making this pan hot. And now this pan is hot because of the Father, but it's its own pan. They are coming from the Father as the God but as something separate. And this all ties into the Hebraic notion, the Hebrew notion of the power of a word. And so it's, it's, it shouldn't be lost on us that John says the word was God, the word is God. He's with God from the beginning because in Hebrew thinking, the, a word that you speak, it takes a life of its own. It is its own thing. And they would teach their children do not speak without thinking because your words carry weight. They have their own life about them in a, in a certain way. And so when, they're, when we think of this, that, that word emanating from a person is its own essence, that's what sonship means. That's what procession means. It's proceeding from the Father. It is his own person, but it's also coming from the Father. And it's so confusing to think about, but it's also how we know God. That we are able to know God because the Son proceeds from the Father and reveals God to us. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son and resides within us as God's people. And so we know God because of the processions that take place within God. And so, like the Son from the Father, the Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, which means 
The Spirit's not created. The Spirit's not the Father nor the Son. And the Spirit's not impersonal. And sometimes I think when we diminish the Spirit just to this vision of the Star Wars force, we think of it in terms of, you know, maybe God created the Spirit so that we can know God. Well, no, the Spirit is God. He's eternal. He wasn't created. Well, maybe the Spirit is, is just another way that we can understand God. Maybe it's just a different mode of God. No, the Spirit is His own person, but He's God. And He's not just some impersonal force. He resides within our hearts. Now, maybe at this point you're thinking, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I didn't know I was coming to a lecture hall, and and I'm sorry for that. But there's a lot of ground to cover when we're talking about these deep things of God, when we're talking about the Trinitarian nature of God. So an analogy that we can use to make sense of this is that of, of military personnel. You know, there's plenty of people who have served in the military, and, and we are thankful for those people who have served our country in the military. But if you ask them, in their, whatever their duty station is, they have different roles when they're there. You know, some of them are, are working you know, behind the scenes. Some of them are mechanics. Some of them are um, going out into the field. There's different roles that happen, but at the same time, they're all soldiers. They're all military personnel. In the same sort of way, within God, He is God. But the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they all have defined roles, defined activities that they do within creation, that they do as a part of being God over creation. And this is something that that, John, that Jesus speaks to in, in John's gospel a little further on in chapter 16. He says, starting in verse 12, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take from what is Mine and declare to you. Everything the Father has is Mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. So if we were to define the Spirit's role in the Godhead, in the triune Godhead, it's that the Spirit makes the things of God known to his creation. The Spirit reveals the things to God's people, to creation, that are the things of God, that we might know God more deeply and intimately. But what exactly is he revealing? Well, that's where we look at the other roles that are going on. The first thing that he reveals is the design, the providence, the will of the Father. He reveals that the Father designs. Look at, um, uh, there's there's one of my favorite Psalms, is Psalm 139, and there's this verse in Psalm 139 that says, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All of my days are written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. The psalmist here, he's speaking to the will, the providence, the the nature of the Father that is beyond time. He saw my days. He saw me when I was formless. When I didn't exist, he saw my existence. That's the architectural will of God, that God designs, God acts providentially, the Father acts providentially over his creation, and the Spirit reveals that to us. And the Spirit also reveals what I refer to as the agency of the Son. And what that essentially means is that the Son enacts the Father's will. Everything that the Father wants to take place in creation, the Son brings into creation. So in the same way that the Son was the word that was spoken to bring light and separate light from darkness, He's also the word that restores the corruption of human nature. The Son both creates and restores according to the Father's will. He is the agent over God's, the Father's creation. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering, referring to Jesus, he has perfected 
those who are sanctified. The Son, this was the Father's will, that His people would be brought back to Him. The Son is the agent by which that takes place. The Son works God's will into His creation. Whether it's cre- bringing creation forth from nothing as the Word, or it's bringing restoration as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The Son is the agent of the Father's will. But then what does that mean the Spirit does? The Spirit directs. If we continue on in that passage in Hebrews, it says the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. And then the author of Hebrews quotes from the Old Testament saying, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, the Lord says. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. The Spirit directs us to the will of God and to the agency of the Son. We know of the Son's redemption, the atoning sacrifice, because the Spirit directs us to us. We know of the Father's will because the Spirit directs us to it. The Spirit directs us to God because the Spirit makes the things of God known to His creation. So as we continue this series over the next few weeks, we're going to be studying more in depth the activity of the Spirit within the triune Godhead. We're going to be studying the different ministries that He does to make the things of God known. But before we could get there, we had to understand the role that the Spirit plays within the triune Godhead. Now, that's a lot of information. But what does this mean for us as God's people? What does it mean if, if the Spirit makes the things of God known to His creation, if, if the Father is, is the one who wills all things and it designs all things, and the Son implements those things as the agent of God, the, the Father's will, and the Spirit directs us to those things, what does any of this mean for us as the church in 21st century. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And what's interesting about the church in Rome is whether they were Jewish or whether they were Gentiles trying to be Jewish, they weren't fully grasping what happened with Jesus or how to apply it to their lives. And so here in chapter 8, verses 14, verses 14 through, through 17, Paul writes, For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if Children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. For Paul, the faith that we have in Christ is not just another religion. It's not just another sect of Judaism. It's not where we can say, we are the nation of Jesus. We're brothers and sisters with Christ because of the Spirit. The Spirit directs us into the family of God. The Spirit changes our hearts and resides within us so that we can now say that we are co-heirs with Christ. This relationship is not maintained by our own accord, through our own strength, through anything that we've merited, that we can say, I've done this, this, and this, God, look, stamp my card for me. But because the Spirit resides in my heart, because the Spirit directs me to the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, because the Spirit directs me to the Father's will that His people be with Him forever. The Spirit of God makes us his children. That's so different from any other religion that's ever been there in history to say that we're not just simply worshiping God 
We're the children of God. We belong to God. We are co-heirs with Christ. And the Paul identifies the Spirit's role in directing us to this truth, both now and throughout all of eternity. And we know that this truth wasn't just some one-off thing that the church thought about and then just moved past. It was something they implemented into every facet of their church life. If you look at how Paul concludes his letters, his letter to um, the Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He wouldn't say that if it didn't have meaning. What he is saying is we are gathered here because of the Father. We are gathered here through the Son's work and we fellowship with one another. We fellowship with the community of God because of the Spirit's continued ministry in our life. So here's what I want us to take away from that this morning. We've covered a lot of information. We've covered a lot of understanding about the Godhead, about the Trinity. But moving forward in this series, what, what do we apply to our life as Christians? Well, through the Spirit's activity, we are co-heirs with Christ. We are part of the family of God, and we're in continual fellowship with God. And I want you to think about that this morning. Because here's what that means. It, it means that we don't come to church to check off a list. We don't come to church at all. We, we are the church. We are the family of God. We are co-heirs with Christ, which means forevermore we're going to be standing in the throne room of God with Christ. We are part of that family. Both here and now, as we gather together to worship, we are part of the family of God in this moment and for all moments, for all of time. And we fellowship with God. In this moment, as we gather together and, and give God praise, as we're going to close out with a song of worship, we are fellowshipping with God. Not because we have earned our ability to do so, but because the Spirit of God is at work within us because the Spirit of God directs us to the Son's work, directs us to the Father's will, and reminds us that even though we don't deserve to be His people, we're His family. We're His children. In this moment and in all moments to come. And so really what we're doing right now, we're not going to church. We are the church. And right now we're fellowshipping with God, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in the spirit as a picture of what we'll do every day forever. And I hope we can appreciate that. That on Sunday mornings when we come together when we're, or when we're at home with our family, when we're sitting in a small group, we're with God the family of God. And it's just a picture of what will be going on forever. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. And then I just, I want us to stand in fellowship with the Spirit, to fellowship with the family of God. And think about that this is just a picture of what we will do for all of eternity. Father, we 